Well, go ahead and make your way with me in your Bibles to the book of Job, chapter number 6. Job, chapter number 6. Uh, what we have been doing is we've been going through or getting started on a series going through the book of Job. Now, with regards to the series, as most of you folks know, normally when we go through a series, I will move somewhat at a snail's pace, uh, good, bad, or indifferent, but that's typically the way that we do it. With regards to the book of Job, though, as we go through the book of Job, what I would like to be able to do is to take the, each of the conversations and the responses and deal with each of those things in their entirety, which means that we will not be uh, putting down very deep roots because there are numerous verses to be able to cover with regards to each one of those things. But there in the book of Job, chapter number 6 and verse number 1, the Bible says, But Job answered and said, Oh, that my grief were thoroughly weighed, and my calamity laid in the balances together. For now it would be heavier than the sand of the sea, therefore my words are swallowed up. Now, we want to put you in remembrance this evening with regards to a few things. Number one is, if you will look back at Job chapter number 5, there beginning in verse number 17, from Job chapter number uh, four, Job chapter 4 and 5 was the response of Eliaphaz to what Job had previously said. Well, a portion of Job's, or a portion of Eliaphaz's discourse that was given to Job, once again, that had covered two chapters, and a portion of that that was put forth there to Job came across as a little bit condemning to Job. In other words, it's almost as if Eliaphaz is taking and telling Job, Job, you really don't know what you're talking about. And just to put you in remembrance of that a little bit, look there with me to Job chapter number 5, beginning in verse number 17. The Bible says there, and this is Job's friend Eliaphaz there saying, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth, therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. Now once again, beloved, we want to kind of stir up your remembrance because it's been a while. Job's whole contention is that his friends continue to take and say, Job, you have sin in your life. And because of the sin that you have in your life, your children are dead. Your livestock's dead. Your life is now in shambles. You're covered with boils from the top of your head to the sole of your feet. Just, Job, hurry up and turn from your sin. And if you will hurry up and turn from your sin, then life is going to get better. But Job's contention already that's been set forth, and it will continue to be set forth, is Job continues to take and say, I do not know of any known sin in my life. If I knew of some blatant sin that I'm sweeping under the rug, then I would repent of it. But at this point in life, I don't know of any hidden sin that's taken place in my life. I don't know of any secret sin. It's not that Job was saying that he was perfect, but what Job was saying is that I do not believe that everything I'm going through is the result of my, my sin. He's saying it's a mystery to me. Well, Eliath has, then he, he chimes in and he says, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. For he maketh sore and bindeth up. He woundeth and his hands make whole. He shall deliver thee in six troubles. Yea, in seven there shall no evil touch thee. In famine he shall redeem thee from death. And in war from the power of the sword. Thou shalt be hid from the scourge of the tongue. Neither shalt thou be afraid of destruction when it cometh. At destruction and famine thou shalt laugh. Neither shalt thou be afraid of the beast of the earth. See, once again, Eliab has these there hammering Job and hammering Job and hammering Job. He won't let up about it. Now, beloved, think with me just briefly of everything that Job's going through up to this point. Think about that last verse there in verse 22. At destruction and famine thou shalt laugh. What has Job just gone through in his life? He just finished going through the funeral of all of his children, beloved. He's just going through the loss of all of the money, all of his livestock, and he's now covered in boils, likely sitting on an ash heap. And here's Eliaphaz saying, you know what? When destruction comes into your life, you'll be able to laugh. And basically what Job was saying all the way through is that Job's saying, I'm sorry, boys, but I'm not in a laughing mood right now. The grass has not yet grown over the graves of my children that I just got done burying. I'm still covered in boils. Now, you fellas may feel like that you can laugh at a time like this, but you're not at a time like this in your life, but I am. And you see, beloved, this is the whole contention that's going on between Job and his friends. Well, there in Job chapter number 6, once again, the Bible says, But Job answered and said, 
Oh, that my grief were thoroughly weighed and my calamity laid in the balances, for now it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore, my words are swallowed up. Beloved, what Job is longing for here from his friends, as we will see over and over and over again, what Job is longing for from his friends is even a half ounce of compassion to be shown towards him rather than just solid condemnation. We'll condemn you, condemn you, condemn you. And you see, beloved, I would to the Lord that after this century was done, after the book of Job was completed, that people, that, that we would have all, even as Baptists, that we would have learned our lesson and taken and said, well, boy, you know what? It don't do any good to kick a person when, they, when they're down. Uh, someone had said years ago, I do not believe that this is true of our church, but someone had said years ago that Baptists are the only ones who shoot their wounded. In other words, if you're sick, we're going to go ahead and kill you because there's no sense in it. But Job is there saying, he's saying, Oh, that my grief were thoroughly weighed and my calamity laid in the balances together. For now it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore, my words are swallowed up. In verse number four, the Bible says, For the arrows of the Almighty are within me, and the poison thereof drinketh up my spirit. The terrors of God do set themselves in array against me. Job comes to the point, I believe, that he actually begins to speak irreverently towards the Lord, but yet Job is absolutely forthcoming about exactly how he feels. Now, we want to make another point while we're here before we can move on. Beloved, it would do us well to strive to hone our abilities to be able to communicate. So oftentimes, I will see people, particularly in our day, in the sense that we will oftentimes suffer alone. We will somewhat feel like, well, I'm not going to tell anyone how I really feel in my heart. I mean, what will they think of me? They'll think I'm a weak Christian, or they'll think I'm backslidden. They may even think I'm lost if I tell people exactly how I feel. And as a result of that, beloved, so oftentimes, our conversations seldom go beyond the level of, of superficiality. In other words, so oftentimes our conversations are just always just right up there on the surface. And if someone were to come up and say, what is the biggest problem you're facing in your life right now? We'd say, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm comfortable sharing that with you. In other words, beloved, we need to come to that place. But in the words of Job, beloved, Job just flat out says there, for the heirs of the Almighty, they're within me. In other words, he still realizes God's in control. The poison whereof drinketh up my spirit. The terrors of God do set themselves in array against me. He goes on to say in verse 5, Do the wild ass bray when he hath grass, or loweth the ox over his father? The, the point is, beloved, is that Job is there saying, you know what? If an animal has got a crib full of things to eat, that animal is not just there carrying on right and left for no reason. But it seemed like Job's friends are accusing Job of whining for no reason at all. And Job's whole point is, I have a reason to be whining. I have a reason to be downhearted. I have a reason to be feeling like I'm destitute in life. Job goes on to ask the question, can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? Think about it. All you salt lovers out there, the young people that love your salt so much, the future people for high blood pressure medicine, amen? Job asked the question, can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? The whole point there, rhetorically speaking, is it's not very good to have to go through things like that. The things that my soul refused to touch are as my sorrowful meat. Oh, that I might have my request that God would grant me the thing that I long for. Now, beloved, when Job comes to this place, we need to ask ourselves the question, what is the thing that Job is longing for in his life right now more than anything else? The Bible answers that question and makes it clear. Even that it would please God to destroy me, that he would let loose his hand and cut me off. You know what Job wants more than anything else? Job wants to die. He wants to be a dead man. He wants to die. Now, beloved, let me ask you the question this evening. If someone were to enter into our assembly tonight and you would say, how are you doing? And someone would take and say, well, there's really one thing that I want more than anything else from God. And you'd say, really, what's that? And if that person would say, I just wish God would let me die. How would you gauge their level of spirituality? Would you say they're lost? Would you say they're semi-spiritual? 
Or would you say that they're ultra spiritual? I hate to say it, but beloved, I believe most of us would take and say they're probably either backslidden or they don't know the Lord. They don't understand good sound theology. But beloved, once again, before we can move on from there, I want to take you back just momentarily and remind you of the the character that Job had and the caliber of a man he was. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. In other words, Job was a super, super spiritual man. And yet when these calamities entered into his life, he comes to be the kind of person who's saying, I just wish God would let me die. And he doesn't just stop there. He says, oh, that I might have my request, that God would grant me the thing that I long for, even that it would please God to destroy me, that he would let loose his hand and cut me off. Then should I have comfort, yea, I would harden myself in sorrow. Let him not spare, for I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. What is my strength that I should hope, and what is mine end that I should prolong my life? In other words, Job come to the place in his life that he's basically throwing up his hands. He's saying, what's the point of all of it? I'm not going to live forever. Sooner or later, I'm going to die. And from my perspective, it might as well be sooner rather than later because then finally my boils will quit bothering me. The thoughts of my deceased children will no longer be on my heart. What is my strength that I should hope? And what is mine end that I should prolong my days? Is my strength the strength of stones or is my flesh of brass? In other words, is Job saying, or what Job is saying is, do I have a resource of strength which is absolutely inexhaustible? And do I have the wherewithal to be able to shoulder up to all of this load? Is my strength the strength of stones or is my flesh of brass? Is not mine help in me and is wisdom driven quite from me? In other words, beloved... We will also mention this right now. There are some phrases in Job, to be quite honest with you, that I have read about every commentary known to mankind, the sound ones at least, and oftentimes they will take and say, that is one of the most peculiar phrases in all the Bible. And sometimes they will take and say, he could be meaning this and he could be meaning that, but really there's never come to perfect agreement on those things. You study it out, maybe the Lord will give you perfect agreement on it. But beloved, I believe what the scripture is teaching is there when he says, is not mine help in me and is wisdom driven quite from me. Job is there basically saying, I'm not a madman. Job is there saying, I know things sound bad and things look bad, but I'm not a madman. Is wisdom driven quite from me? To him that is afflicted, pity should be showed from his friend, but he forsaketh the fear of the Almighty. Beloved, let me point this out as distinctly and clearly as I can this evening. Therefore, Job does utter those words, To him that is afflicted, pity should be showed him from his friend. Who's Job talking to? Three people. His three friends that came from afar. Well, Job was there saying, you know what? To him that is afflicted, the Bible says there, pity should be showed him from his friend. Is he getting any pity from his friends? No, he's not. Beloved, when it comes to the people of God, we also want to point out the fact is that there are going to be conflicts in the Christian life. And the conflicts which are contained in the Christian life, they are a common thing to every Christian who has ever lived. The conflicts may not be exactly like the conflicts Job was going through, but in all of our lives, beloved, as Christians, we will always be facing conflicts. Now, there are times within the church, beloved, that the church is in a position, we as members, we have to take action on this, that, or the other. But, beloved, let me tell you, folks, something. For the most part, we as Christians, when we enter into the Lord's house, this is somewhat of a refuge for us to be able to enter in among the people of God. In other words, beloved, I don't want us to ever feel like, well, we're going to take it every time this member shows up or that member shows up, we're going to follow them in the bathroom and we're going to beat them up. The men for the men and the women for the women. We're going to beat them down and just beat them to a pulp. Beloved, when people come in, the Bible tells us as, us as preachers to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. But the point is, beloved, that there are those three things involved there. And there are sometimes when people does, do need to be reproved. There are sometimes when people need to be uh, exhorted. 
And there are some times when people need reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Whichever one of those things it is, beloved, we need to care carefully for the children which belong to the Lord. As I speak to any of you people, beloved, I realize, you know what, that uh, I will give you a good example. I have a, 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 a relative here in town. He works at UK. He's a, he, he's a brain surgeon there now. And uh, we were talking about this last night. One time when he was just a real, real little tyke, I mean, he was a young little lad. Lo and behold, he bit Josiah on the back. And I mean to tell you, he left a bad set of teeth marks in Josiah's back. Well, his mother wasn't there and his father wasn't there, but old Uncle Brent was there. So Uncle Brent gave him some loving with a bill. He never bit Josiah again. But the point is, beloved, is that after that had happened, I began to consider what is his mother going to say when she comes back? You understand what I mean? Because I didn't know if she would be mad at me. I didn't know if she would shake my hand, if she'd give me a $20 bill. I didn't know what she was going to do. But the point is that that was not my child. Now, once again, with my children, I've given them a couple of spankings through the years. Right, boys? One or two? They're just smiling. At any rate, beloved, with my children, I can spank them, and I'm not really overly worried about it because I, I know that they're my children. But the point is, beloved, that as we deal with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, we must realize that, that Brother Tanner belongs to the Lord. Brother Hart belongs to the Lord. And with them being children of the Most High God, I need to treat them with love and respect as well as all my brothers and sisters in Christ. But the point is, beloved, once again, as Job says there, he asks the question, to him that is afflicted, pity should be shown. Beloved, we must always be careful to show people love within the Lord's church. Because as Christians, we have the world, the flesh, and the devil outside the walls of this sanctuary. And we fight with the world, the flesh, and the devil on a regular basis every single day, day in and day out. Now, is this to say a loving rebuke is never to be rendered at church? No, this is also the place you may get a rebuke if, if, if the pastor deems that you need it. But he says there, to him that is afflicted, pity should be showed from his friend, but he forsaketh the fear of the Almighty. My brethren have dealt deceitfully as a brook, and as the stream of brooks they pass away. In other words, here Job, he sees his three friends coming to him, and lo and behold, as his three, three friends come to him, what was going through the mind of Job? Well, you, you know what? I'm so thankful that my three friends, they're on the way here now. My friends are here now, and in spite of all of the misery that I'm presently enduring, here comes my three friends. I see them coming from afar off. I believe that Job had a little bit of hope that his three friends would offer unto him comfort. And for the first few days they did, but then they go on the attack against Job. And that's why Job makes the statement there. My brethren have dealt deceitfully as a brook, and as a stream of brooks they pass away. In other words, they're here one minute, but then they're going the next. He goes on to say, which are blackish by reason of the ice, and wherein is the snow hid. As he says that phrase there, which are blackish by reason of the ice, the point is, beloved, that in this part of the country, people would oftentimes be wanting a cool drink of water. But when you get there to the brook, and lo and behold, if it is iced over or frozen up, then it would be something which is deceitful, and wherein is the snow hid? What time they wax warm, they vanish. When they melt, they flow away. When it is hot, they are consumed out of their place. The paths of their way are turned aside. They go to nothing and perish. Now, Job goes on then to say there in verse 19, the troops of Tema. Now, remember, Tema was the land of Eliaphaz. That's where Eliaphaz was from. The troops of Tema looked the companies of Sheba waited for them with regards to the streams. They were confounded because they had hoped they came hither and were ashamed. For now ye are nothing, ye see my casting down and are afraid. As the troops of Tema and as the companies of Sheba, they waited for them. They were out there looking for the water. But lo and behold, when they got to the brook, when they got to the streams, they were dried up. And as it says there, they were confounded because they had hoped they came thither and were ashamed. For now ye are nothing, ye see my casting down and are afraid. Beloved, we also want to point this out this evening. Among the people of God, we should be loyal to our Lord and Savior above all else, but we should also be loyal 
to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Not to the same level, obviously, that we're loyal to the Lord because the Lord is faultless. He's absolutely sinless. There's no sin in the Lord. Uh, when it comes to our brothers and sisters in Christ, though, beloved, here's the thing. Between the people of God, we should have one another's backs to the nth degree. I mean to the nth degree. If there's a brother or sister, you call them up at 3 o'clock in the morning, say, man, I have to have someone here to pray with me. If you're working and you can't get off work, then you understand that. If it's the middle of a blizzard and the roads are impassable, then you understand that. That's somewhat of an unreasonable request. But the point is, beloved, that among the Lord's people, that there ought to be this bond which is between us. And it ought to be a bond which is far greater than any bond that we have with anyone out in the world than we have with the people of the Lions Club or the Elks Club or our co-workers or anywhere else. But among the people of God, beloved, there should be that bond that holds the Lord's people together. Uh, some of you no doubt know that song, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds Our Hearts in Christian Love. The fellowship of, uh, I forgot the next phrase, the fellowship, uh, the fellowship of joy divine. You can pay me later for singing for you, amen, is like to that above. And the point is, beloved, that that bond, it ought to be there. Job goes on then to say, he said, did I say bring, bring unto me or give a reward for me of your substance or deliver me from the enemy's hand or redeem me from the hand of the Almighty? Now, as Job's there saying that, it seems that what Job is saying to his three friends is, did I ask you to come here? Did I send you a text message and hey, say, hey, come from a far land and come up here and deliver me from my problem? Job is there basically saying, did I ask you to come here? I believe that he's thankful that they were there for a while at least. But then he goes on to say there in verse number 24, very, very great deal of honesty. What he professed there, teach me and I will hold my tongue and cause me to understand wherein I have erred. Beloved, I believe that even in the midst of all of Job's turmoil and all of his strife, that Job at least still professes to have a teachable spirit about him. How many of you all have ever known an old Christian that they, it seemed like that they got so old that they felt as though they had grown out of having a teachable spirit? How many of you all, you, you met people like that, Brother Hart? Where people are like, you know what, I know everything that there is to know, and if I don't know it, it, then it's not worth knowing. Shut up and leave me alone. But Job still had, beloved, that desire, teach me, and I will hold my tongue, and cause me to understand wherein I have erred. How forcible are right words, but what doeth your arguing reprove? He goes on to say, do ye imagine to reprove words and the speeches of one that is desperate, which are as the wind? Ye, yea, ye overwhelm the fatherless, ye dig a pit for your friend. Now therefore be content, look upon me, for it is evident, evident unto you if I lie. Return, I pray you, let it not be iniquity, yea, return again, my righteousness is in it. He's basically pleading out to his friends there, beloved, to treat him right, to treat him accordingly. Is there iniquity in my tongue? Can not my taste discern perverse thing? Well, see, and it goes back to what we said earlier. They keep telling Job, Job, you have sin in your life. You have sin in your life. Job says, no, I don't have sin in my life. They say, Job, you have sin in your life. Job says, no, I don't have sin in my life. And beloved, we may hear this, but like the Holy Spirit, that's kind of redundant. It's back and forth. Same thing here, same thing here, same thing here, same thing there. Back and forth, back and forth. But beloved, I would ask of you, if we're not careful... Do we also not come to that same place in our lives at various times where it's the same thing over back and forth and back and forth? And there's really nothing new. There's really nothing resolved. There's really nothing settled. But it's just the same thing back and forth, back and forth. How many of you all have ever seen, I, I believe most of you here are parents this evening, with the exception of a few, how many of you all have ever seen children and they, they will get into a, a coil or a spider or something? They'll say, have to, have not, have to, have not. Do your kids ever do that, Brother Hart? Never. Mine never did that either. I read about it in a book somewhere, amen? But it's like children. When children are coming to the place where the one will slap the other, have to, slap back, have not, have to, have not, have to, have not. How does that make you feel as parents? 
Is your daughter saying have to, brother? Okay. Have not. How does that make you feel as parents? My kids need some love. Amen. Is that not childish? But the point is, beloved, that I fear sometimes that we as adults never really grow completely out of that attitude if we're not careful. Now, chapter number 7, we will not be long, I promise you. Is there not an appointed time? This is Job's answer to life has continued. Is there not an appointed time to a man, of the, to a man upon earth? Are not his days like unto the days of an hireling? As a servant earnestly desireth the shadow, and as an hireling looketh for the reward of his work, so am I made to possess the months of vanity, and the wearisome nights are appointed unto me. Job is there saying, I'm sure any of you have ever had a labor-intensive job in your lifetime that you know what it is like for the quitting time to finally roll around. When I was a boy, I used to bale hay, and I'll tell you what, the hotter it was, the better weather it was to bale hay, but it was also the more miserable weather to bale hay. The first cutting of hay was the dustiest mess you'd ever seen. Dust would be coming off the baler, and it was a mess. We would oftentimes look forward even to lunchtime, and then also especially to the end of the day. Well, this is what Job is saying. As a servant earnestly desireth the shadow, and as a hireling looketh for the reward of his work, so am I made to possess months of vanity, and wearisome nights are appointed to me. When I lie down, I say, When shall I rise, and the night be gone? And I am full of tossings to and fro, unto the dawning of the day. I wonder, beloved, have you ever been in this place? There's another passage in the scripture where the Bible says it seemed like when it's morning you wish it was nighttime, and when it's nighttime you wish the morning. In other words, it's as if you're wishing your life away. You just feel like, what is my point of being here? He says there, my flesh is clothed with worms and clods of dust. My skin is broken and become loathsome. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Oh, remember that my life is wind. Mine eye shall no more see good. The eye of him that hath seen me shall see me no more. Thine eyes are upon me, and I am not. As the cloud is consumed and vanisheth away, so he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him any more. Therefore, I will not refrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Once again, beloved, do you see that bold and blatant openness of Job? Job is a miserable man, and he don't, he's not one iota shy about expressing his true feelings unto his friends there. He goes on to say there, Am I a sea or a whale that, settest a that thou settest a watch over me? Once again, a lot of different ideas with regards to what that particular verse is talking about. Uh, the best that I'm able to tell when he says, Am I a sea or a whale that thou settest a watch over me? In other words, beloved, it is, it is this Job is saying, Am I that unruly or am I completely like an animal or a beast that you're trying to watch over me? When I say my bed shall comfort me, my couch shall ease my complaint, then thou scarest me with dreams and terrifiest me through visions, so that my soul chooseth strangling and death rather than my life. The truth is, beloved, that we oftentimes do not like to think about Christians stooping or finding themselves in valleys this low. We don't like to think about it. We like to somewhat live in denial that good Christians can find themselves in such positions as this. But beloved, we do want to point out with regards to these things as well that indeed, beloved, Christians find themselves in positions such as this. Oftentimes, some people at least throughout the course of their Christian life it doesn't mean that they're lost. It doesn't mean necessarily that they have open or blatant sin in their lives. Now, we want to be clear on this because the truth is that when we see someone who is this low and we see someone, I did not know how many times that you folks, maybe some of you here have even been to the place that you just 
You pray, Lord, just take my life. Lord, just end my life. Lord, I'm tired. I'm miserable. I just, I, I just don't want to see another day, Lord. Maybe you have been to this place. Maybe you've only talked to someone else who has been to this place. Maybe you've only read about such people in the scriptures as have been to this place. But here's the point, beloved. Oftentimes we want to figure out why a person is in this place. And that way when we figure out why they're in this place, we can make sure that we never go the same road or commit the same sin. And that way I will never find myself to the place that I just want to die. I'm so unhappy. And that, therefore, beloved, I want to take and put your life under a microscope and say, well, I think it's this or I think it's this. Because if we can figure it out, a problem precisely defined is already partially, to sol or, uh, partially solved. But here's the point, beloved. When you cannot even define what the problem is as the position Job is in right now, it's hard to be able to offer up a solution to a problem that you do not fully understand. And this is where Job is at. He says there once again, When I say my bed shall comfort me, my couch shall ease my complaint, then thou scarest me with dreams and terrifiest me through visions, so that my soul chooses strangling and death rather than life. I loathe it. I would not live all the way. Let me alone, for my days are vanity. He goes on to say there in verse number 17, What is man that thou should magnify him? And that thou should have set thine heart upon him. There's somewhat of a transition in the conversation of the response of Job to Eliaphaz because seemingly and evidently according to the wording of these verses, Job now begins to cast his gaze upon the Lord yet once again. What is man that thou shouldest magnify him, that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him, and that thou shouldest visit him every morning and try him every moment? How long wilt thou not depart from me? nor let me alone till I swallow down my spittle. Once again, in all of history, I believe there's only been two, two usages of this word, till I swallow down my spittle. Uh, most of the people believe that it is equivalent in English to saying, let me catch my breath. In other words, it's saying, just, just give me a breather here. Let me catch my breath. And basically, this is what Job was saying. How long will thou not depart from me, nor let me alone till I swallow down my spittle? I have sinned. What shall I do unto thee? O thou preserver of men, why hast thou set me as a mark against thee, so that I am a burden to myself? And as Job cries out there, I have sinned. What shall I do unto thee, O preserver of men? Basically, Job is there saying, Lord, I, I have sinned. I, I'll admit, no doubt there's sin somewhere. But yet, Lord, I confess my sin, and still it feels as though there's no reprieve from the, the burden that I'm bearing. He says, and why doest thou not pardon my transgression? Lord, why won't you forgive me? I do not know how many times that you folks have encountered people like this, but over the course of the years of my ministry, I've encountered uh, probably two or three people who they have come to this place in their lives, spiritually speaking, that they feel like they cannot be forgiven from the Lord. And oftentimes what it comes down to is they will get hung up on the unpardonable sin. I've had people sit in my office and sit in my presence and say, I, just, I know I've committed the unpardonable sin. You say, well, why do you, why do you believe you've committed the unpardonable sin? They say, well, I asked the Lord to forgive me. I've asked the Lord to lift the burden from me, and God just won't do it. So therefore, there's sin in my life, or there's some kind of sin there that God will not forgive me for, some kind of sin that I cannot be cleansed from. And thus the burden will never, ever be lifted. They're some of the most sorrowful people that I've ever met or attempted to counsel on the face of the earth. Oftentimes it seems as though that they're beyond help. But as Job expressed there in verse 21, And why doest thou not pardon my transgression and take away mine iniquity? For now shall I sleep in the dust, and thou shalt seek me in the morning, but I shall not be. Now, beloved, the blessed news is this. Job felt as though he had come to the end of his journey, come to the end of his life, and he expressed it in a forceful manner there. The difference in us and Job, at least at this point in the life of Job, is that Job is unable to see the end of the story. Now here's the point, and I want to, want to remind you folks of this as we depart this evening. No matter what it is that we're going through in our lives, Beloved, we must always remember that for as long as we're still eating and sleeping 
and breathing this earth's air, we're not able to see the end of the thing. Now here's the point. You may be at a place right now in life where everything you can see, for as far as your human eye is able to see, everything looks dark and dreary and dim and miserable. But beloved, remember, this is not yet the end for you. And one day when the Lord unfolds all of these things, we will be able to look back on these things and be able to take and say, Thou doest all things well. All of them. A phrase to that song that we said tonight, uh, I'm not going to sing again. I won't put you through that. Uh, something about when we get to eternity, it will only bring a smile. What, what was that phrase, Brother Hart? Do you remember that phrase in that song? Until then, um, the, the, the greatest trials that we face in this lifetime, when we look back on these things, they will only bring a smile. Beloved, how many things can we look back on in our lifetime now and as we look back at some of the greatest trials that we'd ever gone through, we're able to take and smile about those things and say, God delivered me, not just once, not partially, but completely. Did you find it, brother? The things of earth that cause the heart to tremble, remember there the Lord will bring a smile. The things of earth that cause the heart to tremble, remember there will only bring a smile. Beloved, one day, the greatest affliction you've ever known in this lifetime, as we look back on it in heaven, you'll smile about it. It's hard to see that now. And we have to beware of telling other people, turn that frown upside down, get over it. That don't work. But just remember, beloved, God is still working on each of us. Amen. Yeah.